AC, as we as we wind down the summer, I mean, it's the end of July. Uh, you know, we're going to be getting into fall soon. What better excuse than to take a detour on our uh, trip beyond Hammerland to stop off and visit a, a local attraction? It's a crypt, and I hear they tell stories there. Tales, you might even say. I do Tales say. from the crypt. Uh, we're talking about the 1972 Amicus film, not the uh, the wonderful, uh, informative uh, HBO Tales from the Crypt series from 1989. Uh, or even specifically the Tales from the Crypt comics from the 50s from EC Comics, although this was based on that. Um, we're talking about uh, a, an English horror anthology. Uh, before we get into my history or lack of history with this movie, AC, how you doing? I'm doing well. And actually, I didn't realize what a Tales from the Crypt fan you were prior to uh, our show today. Had you seen Had you seen this version of Tales from the Crypt? No, and this okay. gets into my non-history. <laughs> Great. Okay, cool. Um, when I was, you know, the, the HBO show came out when I was 12, and it was around that time that I think I saw a documentary called, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm totally forgetting, uh, Comic Book Confidential, mm -hmm. uh, which is about the, the whole history of comics up to the mid-80s. And they had a big section on 1950s horror comics and, you know, you know, Frederick Wortham and all that stuff. So I started looking up. They, they did some reprints in 89 or 90, like actual comics reprints that were fantastic. I became obsessed. And one day I saw the 1972 Tales from the Crypt in a video store. And it had this weird, like kind of a corny skull with an eyeball uh, artwork. And it was all like British people. I was like, OK, someone just took the name. It has nothing to do with the comics. So I didn't bother. Until this morning, <laughs> it's been three decades that I've completely ignored this bona fide tie in to the comics that I love for my youth. Yep. And now I'm like, what have I done with my life? Because this is a wonderful anthology. Oh, good. Uh, I had a great time with it. And I can't wait to talk to you about it. For for viewers of, of who haven't been paying attention the last couple of episodes, Ian has not been as delighted with some of my choices for Beyond Hammerland. So I'm thrilled that he uh, that, that this one resonated with you. Yeah, uh, this was my first of the Amicus anthologies. And we'll, we'll back up and, and talk a little bit about the history of Amicus. Uh, but yes, this was my entry to the Amicus anthologies. They did, I think, seven, maybe eight of them. And uh, I, I love them. Uh, I love them for many reasons. And we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but yes, and, and the whole EC Comics, my history with that was, you know, back in the days before VHS, uh, I spent a lot of time at the library and learning about horror films. And someone directed me toward, hey, we have these bound copies of these horror comics you might also like. I loved my librarian. God bless you wherever you are. Uh, but she said, hey, we got these, these, you know, like, and they had Tales from the Crypt. They had Vault of Horror. And I was like, wow. And uh, I remember uh, Stephen King, I think, references this particular, you know, uh, segment where it's a baseball game and the guys, you know, like one of the guys poisons his spikes and kills one of the other players. And so they take the revenge. And I was like, so this was right up my alley. So when I saw Tales from the Crypt, this version, this 1972 version, it wasn't as explicit as the comics. It was kind of, you know, cheesy and fun, but I, I like me some good horror fun. And so I went along for the ride and uh, I, I'm super excited to dive in. Cool. I, it's, it's funny that you called it cheesy and fun. I didn't, maybe it's just me. Um, I didn't think it was cheesy. I thought it was, you know, a bit strange and, and earnest and over the top, but Explain cheese to me. What's your definition of cheese in this context? I think cheese to me is something where it's a little rich, um, and that can be by any any number of elements. Uh, you know, because what makes things rich is the amount of fat uh, in in dietary uh, dietary language, and that fat can show up in a lot of different ways. And in this case, I feel like the fat comes from a little bit of overserving in terms of the performances. Um, and, and again, I enjoy it. I, I thought it was, it, it, but I mean, like uh, Rafe Richardson's interpretation of the Crypt Keeper, Crypt Keeper is very much a twinkle in the eye and a raised brow, you know, so he, everybody's kind of in on the joke, as it were. And that's what makes it fun. 
Yeah, I, I'm I'm there with you. It, he it did take me a bit of getting used to like the film. There's a weird dynamic between this and the HBO show that would come out, you know, 17 years later or whatever, because both open with this sort of you know ominous music and a and a pan through of like a crypt and eventually going down into the crypt. Although in the 72 version, it's strange because it's all daytime. Like it's the least mm -hmm. <laughs> intimidating, mm -hmm. scary, yeah. whatever. And there's, there are a group of people um, who are going on a tour of this, apparently uh, a significant religious, you know, burial crypt. And five of them, I think, get cut off from the, the regular tour group and they end up going down into this mysterious cave. A door opens and there's a guy in a robe sitting at the foot. Well, he appears. Initially, when they're scanning the room, right. they see this giant yeah, skull-like throne, right? And there's no one sitting there. He eventually appears and begins telling them. Uh, each person steps up and, and they get told a story about their life. And it's presented almost as you know, we were all on our way to do other things, but, uh, you know, here's a cautionary tale. So don't go do this. And right. they're sufficiently horrified because all these tales end in some kind of a, a tragedy or the, the main and or the main character's death. Right. Um, in the Tales from the Crypt comics, there is a guy in a tattered robe. He looks much more like a like, a you know, an old crone or, a, you know, what might conceive of as a warlock, uh, spiders and snakes and stuff all around. This guy is a little bit too clean looking. He's miles away from the Crypt Keeper skeleton who's like For constantly sure. cracking wise and everything. This guy's pretty sincere. But the, the other connection I thought was really strange. In 89, HBO launched with three episodes kind of as an hour and a half package. One of those stories was, and all through the house, I think that was the first one. That's the first story we get here with Joan Collins. That's right. It's a woman who's just murdered her husband like on Christmas Eve. And wouldn't you know it, at the same time, there's a maniac Santa who's escaped from the local loony bin uh, on the loose. These segments are only about 12 minutes long. So about half the length of a Tales from the Crypt episode from HBO. So it was a bit jarring to me when Santa shows up. I'm like, well, this is the part where they do the whole chase around the house and it becomes more of a slasher movie thing. But no, it's like, hey, look, mommy, Santa's here. And then it's right. kind of over. <laughs> yep. Yep. I I, uh, I I like that. And and it was the first time I'd seen a killer Santa presented uh, it, you know, years before Silent Night, Deadly Night. Uh, but let's let's back up just a little bit because this idea of the anthology. So. Uh, and I just had a presentation of uh, The Raven over at the Chicago Public Library, which was inspired by Roger Corman's anthology of uh, Tales of Terror, which came out in 1962. But that was a portmanteau format that had uh, had been embraced. The last time we really saw it was in 1946's uh, Dead of Night, which is a British British anthology directed by different directors, each segment directed by different directors with a wraparound story. But then we don't really see that format again until Tales of Terror in 1962. And then we see it again in 1963 with Mario Bava's Black Sabbath. And then in 1965, we have Dr. Terror's House of Horrors, which is the first of the anthologies from Amicus. And Amicus had sprung up as kind of a competitor to hammer. In right. fact, uh, Milton Sabotsky and um, oh Max Rosenberg, they had presented Hammer with a script for Frankenstein back before they had made Curse of Frankenstein, back before Jimmy Sangster had written the script. Because they had br brought this script to Hammer and it had later, you know, they later made a Frankenstein film, there was a bit of a payoff to Rosenberg and Sabotsky because we're not using your script for Frankenstein, but we're going to do a Frankenstein movie. So just to make things simpler, we will pay you for the Frankenstein idea. They took that money and created Amicus Studios. And that must have been a big payout. <laughs> which proved to be a Hammer's main competitor throughout the rest of the 60s and 70s, because they were employing a lot of the same actors uh, uh, that Hammer was using, uh, several of which show up here in this this anthology, but you know people like Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing, uh, you know it's it, so it became very cost effective for Amicus to do these short films 
and then piece them all together because you only needed those actors for a couple of days. You could knock the story out and then you could move on to the next segment. And so this, you know, Tales from the Crypt, even though it's the first time it was inspired by the EC comics, that anthology format had been a tried and true uh, format for Amicus up to that point. They had done Dr. Terror's House of Horrors. They had done Torture Garden and they'd done The House That Dripped Blood. All those preceded Tales from the Crypt. Tales from the Crypt, however, was one of their biggest hits. And I think because of that name recognition. So they did Tales from the Crypt. And then the following year, they did Vault of Horror. And both right, and you, kind of like a one-two. Yeah, I know you can find both of them together on a Blu-ray that's out that's right, right now, um, which I'm going to have to order because I, I love this movie. Um, but I, I, maybe you know this because you're into the history of this. Uh, why did they take were those other anthologies building up to tales from the crypt or like hey we've kind of got this down we might as well do something that's sort of you know more famous was it a rights issue i'm just if if they had this in mind why not just lead off with that well and that's the i don't know what the answer to that is uh i think it is simply that they were the idea of the anthology had resonated for them as opposed to the idea of adapting tales from the crypt i think they were thinking hey, what can we use for our next anthology? And we've got Tales from the Crypt right here in front of us. Why not use that? Yeah. And I, for as much as a Tales from the Crypt fan as I was as a kid, um, I haven't read nearly all the stories. In fact, I'm making my way through this. And like Dark Horse Comics has put out these big anthology collections, which is really nice, complete with the old ads from the comics and stuff. That's great. <laughs> well, um, but so aside from, I, I feel like a number of these stories that are in this film felt familiar to me, even though mm. I couldn't peg like, oh, I've definitely read this comic story. Um, but that's fine. They all feel very much like they came right out of the comics, which was great without doing the, for as much as, you know, everybody loves creep show, they don't go for the, Hey, this is a comic book. We're going to have like these weird panel transitions. Everything's going to go to like four color dot printing or something. Um, but I really did like the comics uh language that is spoken in the film and i think it's the last story and we can jump around here but there's a guy who ends up in this kind of makeshift house of horrors built by a team of blind people um <laughs> and as he his fate comes down on him the lights go out and you hear him like screaming that is such a tales from the crypt thing where there's like a blackout panel and i can just imagine seeing the mm -hmm. yarg mm -hmm. kind of like descending down into the yeah, bottom yeah. of the frame oh it's so good um but going through uh each of these and we don't have to like get into the each of these in depth but was there one or two that you'd like to lead off with that really spoke to you and said this is why i love this particular film well, and what I do like about these is that they all all are very simple. They have a good beginning, middle, end. It is a great setup and and delivery. Uh, I love all through the house. I think you know starting with the first one is a great place to start because. But let's back up just a second because the wraparound on this one, I feel, is probably the weakest part of it, in that it's not it's not very strong in terms of setting up why these stories are being told or how they came to be there. It's all a little convenient. And I feel like it's the least, uh, it's the least thought out of the previous ones in Dr. Terror's house of horrors. You have a bunch of, uh, passengers on a train. They're all sitting in a train compartment and Dr. Terror played by Peter Cushing is reading their fate via tarot cards. And so that's why they all came to be there. Here, it's just kind of like they conveniently end up at this crypt. Uh, oftentimes, we, you know, we've heard them, we hear them say, I, I was on my way somewhere else and I felt inclined to pull in here, you know. So I think a stronger wraparound would have been advantageous. It's better than Vault of Horror, which is basically these guys get stuck in an elevator, they end up on the bottom floor. And they all decide to sit, well, let's just sit around and tell stories. And I'm like, wow, that is, that's some weak sauce there. Uh, but I do like Ralph Richardson. It's just not uh, necessarily the Crypt Keeper that we've come to know and love, either from the comics or from the TV show. And I, I think that's, that's fine. I do like the, you know, the, the very last shot is very much like the devil and Daniel Webster, where Satan is kind of like flipping through his little book of like who his next victim is going to be. And he kind yeah. of points up and points at you. Yeah. Um, but I, I like the wraparound 
mostly because it's confusing as to are they in hell or limbo? Do they still have a chance? There's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a tell, which I thought was a continuity error in that Joan Collins, um, as she's part of this tour group and they're getting cut off from everyone else, she drops her brooch right. and someone picks it up and she pins it back on. And that brooch turns out to be when we see her story in the anthology, it's a Christmas gift from her husband. So how would she be able to have that before, you know, she uh, murder, right? went to, yeah, right into the, into the cave. So, but I did like this idea. We've seen this in other movies. I don't know if we've seen it in films before this, uh, but heaven's waiting room where you go up and you see all mm. these people kind of waiting to be judged or sometimes at a, a lobby or whatever. We don't really see that with, uh the the going the other way and i could just see this as being i liked it because it seemed kind of like a tease like when you go up to heaven you're in the white clouds and you, you know there's angels and horns and there's no doubt about where you're going i would just think that if you're going to hell satan or whoever might want to mess with you a little bit like <laughs> this is this is messed up but this is as good as it's going to get forever um my one i guess beef with it is they had a really lovely image at the very end. And this is a spoiler, but once they realize that they're doomed, the one guy goes to leave and the door opens up and there's this brilliant light that comes through, especially in the restored version of this. I watched it on Tubi, mm. but it looked really nice in high definition. It's this great Spielbergian like splash of light. And he goes up and he stands in the door and he's looking out at something. And you're like, what's beyond there? And he, of course, takes a step and he ends up falling. And then it goes to this really cheesy, like, yeah. oh, he's going into a fire pit. But it's the, some of the worst graphics I've ever seen. Yeah. He could have just fallen in and you heard his scream. But then there's this really spooky image of the re the other four people just like standing up, getting in line and marching down towards the door. They yeah. don't protest. There's no cries or screaming. They just all kind of are resigned, maybe just drawn because like there's no use with the pretense to their fate. And I thought that was really effective. Yeah, I really, and I really like that too. And yes, I agree. It's, it's, uh, it's some not great, uh, green, green, blue screen. I guess it would be blue, blue screen back then, uh, of a falling down into the pit, but it's like, Oh, oh, well, but I it can't say that like the special effects in this are not necessarily, you know, like what, what this movie's about. In fact, that's like, the, that's the specialist of the special effects we get, I think. Right. I mean, and it does have the problem of like the, the early 70s films where they show blood and it's very <laughs> bright red paint. Yep. There's a bit where Joan Collins is cleaning up her crime scene and she it looks like she's literally scooping paint up into a into a glass. Um, you just got to kind of go with it, as as they say. But yeah, all through the house is, is very fun. I liked I was thinking about the filmmaking while it was going on, mm. which is usually that takes me out of a film. But I was very much invested in first the husband he's apparently alone in the house and it seems like he's a really loving guy because he looks at the note that he's written for his wife on the present he sits down with the newspaper by the fire the newspaper's up and then all of a sudden bam there's like a splash of blood and then he falls over and you realize she's just like axed him in the head with a fire poker um and you know it's all just the soundtrack or the scoring of this is all christmas carols yep and it's creepy because there's just one after the other. There's no like score to, you know, right to, to, you know, of note. Um, I think Joan Collins does a, a pretty good job as the guilty person trying to clean up this mess. And then she just like, oh, yeah, there's a maniac out there. And my daughter's just let him in the house. I kind of liked that it wasn't protracted. I just wasn't ready for it. It's the most ill thought out murder I think I've ever seen. That's what I was watching this time. I was like going, wow, like she didn't think about this at all. It's like, wait, you got the kid upstairs. You're you, you're sitting in a white room. It's like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, just hang on. Like, take a moment to think about how this might play out. Uh, and then and then she hits upon the idea of like, well, I'll make it look like he fell down the stairs. You know, it's like, oh man, you did not you did not think about this. I mean, apparently he said something in the kitchen, and <laughs> that was it. Like, just something snapped. She was done. Yeah, it's all about like the life insurance policy or something like that. But even, yeah, when she sends him tumbling down the stairs, she goes down 
to adjust the body. She actually puts her hands on his neck and like turns his head the other way. And then she drips the blood around it. Like right. any forensics person worth their salt. And I know this is 50 years ago, but still they'd be able to figure out she didn't even put <laughs> gloves on. <laughs> yeah, no, this is anyway, like I said, I was just like, this is not well thought out, John. No, but, but I did like the final shot of Santa coming into the house and strangling mom in front of the fireplace. And we see this from the perspective of the fireplace with yep. the flames jumping up, which is, you know, a bit of a, a of a tell. Of a, yep. Yep. Yeah. I like that. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's fun. Like all of these are, are fun to some degree. Um, what's the next one? Um, let's see. Uh, oh, the, uh, the cheating husband leaves uh is it's like i don't think this movie likes couples very much <laughs> but or families not a big fan um, no <laughs> but uh there's a guy named carl who leaves his wife and uh and kids to go off with the mistress they're leaving it you know late at night they get into a horrible car accident and he eventually he essentially comes back from the dead but there's a time jump and I don't know if how much some of these things are so simple that they're mm -hmm. like just automatically spoiling them, just talking about like the main idea of it. But right. what did you make of this one? Well, I, I mean, I like I like the circular aspect of it where it's it's a repetition, like he gets caught in a loop where he just basically dies over and over and over again. Uh, because he 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 and his mistress are driving away, he you know. Uh, falls asleep. He wakes up at the start. He's like, oh, had had a bad dream. And then the truck, you know, runs them off the road and everything, you know, uh, tumbles down the hill, everything blows up. And then from there is where he kind of makes his slow return home. It takes him two years to, to walk home, apparently. And I'm like, did nobody, but I, I mean, everybody who, and I like the fact that it's seen from other people's point of view, we or rather we're watching it from his point of view and people reacting to him. Uh, and that's Ian Hendry playing our lead actor. And we just talked, we just saw him in theater of blood earlier this year. And he's also in captain Kronos. He's one of the toughs in the, in the tavern that uh, captain Kronos best. So I, I always enjoy seeing Ian Henry show up. I think he's he's quite good here, even though he doesn't have a ton to do, uh, you know. But he he does he does a nice job. And again, I like the fact that once he gets back home, he finds that his wife is remarried. He goes over to his mistress' house. She finds out she's blind, and then he goes back into the loop again. And I I do love the the reveal of like we come when he comes to it's all very much his point of view we see his you know hands like grabbing for doorknobs and knocking on things and, and right. making his way around it's not until he goes to his uh, mistress's apartment discovers she's blind she sees a framed photograph on like a coffee table it's a glass or a, a mirrored coffee table yep. and he moves it and that's when he catches very briefly you catch a glimpse of what he looks like and you understand why everyone's freaking out he's got like you know blue face and sores it's a really effective little piece and i just wonder considering what the guy is about to go through in the crypt would it have been better to be stuck in this <laughs> groundhog day loop of, yeah. of dying in a car accident yeah. forever uh but then the next one um which is uh it's the valentine's day one oh. with good old saint peter cushing as arthur grimsdyke who is it's it's one of my favorite uh turns of his uh, it's very small, but it, it gives him a chance to be the sweetest version of Peter Cushing. The Peter Cushing that we all knew was in there. I just, and I still, I'm getting a little bit like pre-misty eyed just talking about his performance. Because when I was watching this morning, I just wanted to crawl into the screen and give him a hug. I'm like, yep. I'll, because he's a, he's a widower. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's like Tales from the Crypt's take on the movie Up. There's a mm. uh, very wealthy developers and uh, community sprout spread up around this this one senior citizen and his holdout crappy apartment. And everybody just wishes that he would sell it and move away so they could build another McMansion. Um, and the people living directly across from him are a fabulously wealthy father and son. The son is probably in college, I guess. And he devises all these schemes to try and compel this guy to uh, move away. He uh has the guy's dogs taken away from him by the city 
he uh, warns the parents that, you know, the guy is very popular around the, around the kids of the area because he makes them toys and he's you know, kind of a grandfatherly figure. He kind of puts it in their head that he might be, you know, doing stuff with them in his house. And finally, the coup de grace is Valentine's Day. Uh, old Mr. Grimsdyke is elated. He gets a mailbox full of cards from people. They're of all Valentine's cards, and each one is more despicable than the last. Brilliant, brilliant rhymes, but they're like rhymes about how he should just kill himself and nobody likes him and he's hated. Um, and then, of course, what do you think happens? Um, the rich people get their wish because Mr. Gr Mr. Grimsdyke uh, kills himself, but he doesn't stay dead. <laughs> <laughs> One year later, he comes back. A lot of time jumping in this one. Um, and it's weird because I felt like they could have left out the mysticism because he's not just an old man. He he talks to his wife, you know, frequently, who's passed on, but he's into Ouija boards and like all this other weird mystic art stuff. Is that yep. to help us believe that that's how he came back? Because I think so. Given I, mean, the, I think that's, I think that's, I, I don't know why else it would be in there is just to, to inform how he's able to come back in a year and, and have his revenge. Yeah. It's just, it's like, we've seen these kinds of stories throughout Tales from the Crypt and sure. Vault of Horror and other EC stuff without the aid of those kind of like other supernatural toys, I, I guess it just struck me as weird. Well, it's funny because on our creep show episode that I, I recently did um, over on the Horror 101 channel, uh, I took Father's Day to task because I'm like, why? Why does Nathan Grantham come back this year? And it's like, well, it's Father's Day. I'm like, it's always Father's Day. <laughs> That's like the whole lead in is like how they talk about how Bedelia comes every single year and sits out there and talks to Nathan, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, why is this year any different? How has he just like come up out of the grave? And it's like, well, he spilled the drink. I'm like, That's it? You know? That's, that's, <laughs> okay. That was what he was waiting for. He's waiting for if she just spills the drink one time. So, you know, like I like a little bit of explanation like that did not bother me. I'd rather that than like just be like, oh, and he comes back because that guy was a bad guy. Yeah. I mean, I, I see your point. Um, I think the the end of this, uh, this is why I love each of these segments has one detail in it that is so distinctly tales from the crypt. Yeah. In this case, it's the rich kid's father who comes down one morning. His son has been horribly murdered by the ghost of Grimsdyke. But in addition to that, there's a giant piece of like almost butcher paper written in blood, you know, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a rhyme that ends, you know, at the end of it, the punchline is his heart is wrapped up in this in this butcher paper. I'm like, yes, that's William Gaines is smiling from the afterlife at that one. If I could, I'm going to try and recall the, the rhyme. I uh, have it written down. You were mean and cruel right from the start. Now you really have no dot, unwrap. dot, dot. Yep. Yes. Oh, so good. <laughs> And you remembered that one. I had to write it down because I, I watched this at 4 a.m. <laughs> I've um, also seen this one a few times. I also, I really like, it's a it's a simple makeup job, but I really like the the returning Grimsdyke, uh, just that look. It's like, it's, and I feel like I've seen that, that image of him coming up out of the grave in so many reference books. So it was very kind of iconic for me. And so when I finally got to see it firsthand, I was like, Oh wow! You actually don't get to see that much of Grimm's Dyke. You know, you get to see him come up out of the ground, and then you get to see him kind of coming toward the uh, the sun. But I also love the fact that you kind of see him move across the room in the back, uh, like uh, as the the sun is at the desk. He's either outside the window or he's inside the room. But you see him kind of cross the room, and you I go, missed that. "Oh dear, this is Ooh. not going to go well." I, that's a great excuse to go back and watch this again because I, I missed that that detail. Man. Um, all right. So the next one is a take on the monkey's paw. Yes. I love that they're not just ripping off the monkey's paw. They're making reference to the monkey's paw, which kind of makes it okay. Within to it. Yeah. Monkey's paw. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't you ever read the monkey's paw? That's what's going on right now. Um, so there's a guy named Ralph and he's well, a wealthy businessman who finds out that something's gone wrong and he's lost all of his money. Worse than that, he's horribly in debt. Um, goes back to his wife and breaks the news. And looking through all their kind of trinkets, they find this statue. And uh, it, there's an inscription at the bottom. And the, the 
last sentence is missing. Of course, it's basically course. the don't do this. Whatever you do, please, God, turn away. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they make a, a wish. And, you know, the the hus the wife wishes that they could be, you know, fabulously wealthy or yeah, I can't remember exactly. She wants to be rich or she. Well, that's what the thing says. She says, I wish for more money. I wish for more money. Right. And then the husband gets a phone call from the accountant and says, you got to get down here right away. It involves money. <laughs> and the husband's like, awesome. And then he goes for a drive. And this is this really felt like padding because it's the world's longest, most boring car chase <laughs> ever. <laughs> There's a there's a patrolman or a guy in a motorcycle, whoever is following this guy. And there's a car crash because at the last minute, Ralph looks up into the rearview mirror. He doesn't see a, a skeleton. He sees very clearly an actor wearing a skull mask. Skull mask <laughs> on the helmet, which I think on is kind of cool. I, I like I mean, and I've seen this a few times. So, I mean, I like to, I like to, I want to buy myself one of those helmets that has the, the skull mask built onto the front. I'm sure they have it um, somewhere. But um, so, yeah, it turns out that he's horribly dead and she gets all the money, not his money. It's now hers on top of the life insurance policy that that he had. And she's like, oh, this is terrible. I, I just want my husband back. And she makes a wish. The accountant or the estate manager has come over to the house and she's all bereaved. And she explains the statue, puts her hands on the statue, says, I want my husband back. Um the way he was before the crash, just before the crash, just before the crash. Um, and so all of a sudden the door opens and these mysterious undertaker folks, undertakers, I was going to call them groomsmen, but that's not what that is, <laughs> but they, they come in and they're wielding a coffin and Ralph is in the coffin and he's dead because it turns out the crash didn't kill him. It was a heart attack that happened right yep. before the crash. Oh, so you monkey's like, paw. Yeah. And I, I loved it because I thought he was going to come back as a zombie. That's the obvious Tales from sure, the Crypt kind of right. twist. But then on top of that, she's like, okay, this is not what I wanted. I want my husband back, but I want him to be alive and with me forever. And she really thinks about this wish very hard. Instead of the 15 seconds of the previous wish, she thinks right. about it for like 45 seconds and makes the wish. Unfortunately, the husband immediately springs to life and he's writhing in pain and screaming. And the under uh, the accountant's like, you idiot. <laughs> they embalmed him. <laughs> so now he's alive, but he's burning on the inside. Yep. And chopping up doesn't help because he's going to be alive, alive forever. forever. Yep. Every part of him. Well done. Well done. Tales from the Crypt. I just kept thinking about that. Like, what does she do uh, at that point? Does she just like have him buried somewhere so he, she can't hear the screaming? Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. You know, because that's that he's going to be in this state forever. And it's uh, that I mean, that one has a real sting to it that lasts. It's similar to the uh, Ian Hendry one where it's the loop. It's, the you know, like this is going to keep happening. He is stuck this way for eternity. Yeah. And it's. It's a bit of a conflict, too, because at the beginning of the story, he's not painted as like the greatest of guys. You know, he's he's kind of a jerk and you kind of assume he's like a regular, you know, rich a-hole or something. Right. But then to see his fate, you're like, I don't know if he deserves that <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because he's he's ripped open. You know, uh, he's torn at himself and she's like stabbing him. You see his guts ripped open. and It looked almost like. Um, Ash, the alien from Alien, yeah. or the android from Alien, it's all like white and bubbly. Which kind of, I was, I was like, wow, like there's some actual like literal guts on display here. I had forgotten that. I think that that probably doesn't play on TV, which was where I, I saw it for the most part. But yeah, I was like, wow, there's, there's literal guts here. Yeah, it's a, it's a gutsy way to end a story for sure. Hey. Um, which, <laughs> which brings us to. Mm. I don't know if this is the longest one, but it definitely it almost felt like it was twice as long as the other entries. Um, but it's about a, an institute for the blind, which gets a new manager, um, Major Rogers and Shane, his pet dog, yep. former military guy brought in to manage the place is all like elderly blind men. And he's all about like cutting costs and, you know, making the place profitable to, uh, you know, he turns off the heat at dusk 
-hmm. meaning all these guys are like freezing in their horrible conditions. He cuts back on the food. So they're getting basically it's one person describes it as like dishwater with some carrots floating in it. Meanwhile, he's in his office eating steak and a nice salad. Um, and the uh, the people eventually revolt after one of their own particularly elderly man dies in the night of, you know, cold. Uh, and yeah, they build, they throw him in a cell where there's apparently a dungeon under this place. And there's this army of blind men work together to build the most elaborate saw tri trap dungeon that I've ever seen. How? What? <laughs> I, this is, uh, well now is, but I, but the thing is like, I buy this. Like I bought, I, they invested it. So they, they invest you so completely in it that you're like, okay, here's how this is done. You know, the blind people are finding the edges and they're cutting and they're using, you know, they're helping each other get from place to place. You know, I was like, I love the fact that it, and I love the fact that it takes as long as it does because it feels very deliberate. Yes. Um, and, you know, like, again, we have our, our major character, you know, he's set up, he's, he's, He's coming from a military background where the generals are generals, you know, the officers are officers and the infantry are infantrymen, you know, and, and, and yes, the officers deserve to be treated like officers. And in some regards, I think like that is a, a I think that's a military thing that is that they don't mix with the enlisted men. Like mm -hmm. there's meant to be a hierarchy and he sets up that now, he proves himself to be a jerk because, you know, as he's cutting costs, he's also buying, you know, fine paintings for his office. You know, he's feeding his dog the steak as well. You know, he's drinking fine wine. So it's like, yes, he's cutting costs, but he's also reaping the benefits of it. Right. You know, he gets rid of it. Oh, I, this is the first time I saw this. He takes their extra blankets and that becomes the bedding for his dog. I, I never did, picked I up on that before. I caught that, and it's great because they don't. The, the characters don't even say it. The the, right. the 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 head blind guy who I can't remember what his name was, but he's an an actor from who was in a Clockwork Patrick, Orange. Patrick McGee is the actor. Okay, but he doesn't. He notices this, but he doesn't say anything, and it registers with us and him. But he, you just get the feeling that, like, yep, that's a uh, that's it. <laughs> our the the thing that could have saved our friend. Um, who's been living with us and among us for how many, who knows how many decades. Right. Uh, now it's the thing it could have saved him is now a dog's blanket. Um, I do wonder about, I almost want a making of the building of this thing within mm. the reality of the universe because when he, when his cell is opened, he's inside this encasement, this almost like a tunnel with like netting. Right. But he can't get out, but he goes down one passage and it's, a narrow passageway with razor blades jutting out each side. Yep. How did they put that together with not being able to see anything? Uh, very carefully. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, a, so, it's such a great image that I think I'm is. willing to forgive it. Like, because it is, as you say, it's a whole row of these, of the, the panels. And then you have like the razor blades all along it and the camera comes along the side and like just kind of like follows the edges literally uh freddie francis is our director we haven't even mentioned the fact that he's uh he's a director he, uh, most hammer fans will recognize his work um and milton sabotsky our one of our producers he provided the script as he did with many of these anthologies and uh, other scripts for amicus well yeah and I, I i was going to mention freddie francis earlier so i'm glad you brought him up because i obviously forgot but you know I am a big fan of the, you know, the 60s hammer stuff that we've talked about. And I know the few times we've dipped into the 70s, uh, I like with Dracula 80, 1972, I was like, this is a new flavor, a new flair. But there's just something kind of for me lost in the grandeur and the production value of those mm -hmm. old hammers with the castles. I felt like that was sort of reclaimed here mm -hmm. in in this Amicus version, because, yeah, even though my modern brain is like, oh, it's a saw dungeon. I'm thinking back to 1972. Have people seen anything like this? This looks right. it looks dangerous just to be on the set. I know it's all probably fake blades and everything, but yeah. it's it's hard to look at because it's so narrow that you imagine you almost have to turn to your side and walk very carefully to not cut yourself on these things. And of course, they unleash the dog 
and the dog comes out and he has no choice but to run back the way he came and that's when it blacks out and everything i did feel a bit bad about the dog i <laughs> he's gonna get fed but i don't know if they're if the blind guys are going to let the dog out because the dog was kind of a jerk too, but that's just how he was raised. Lingering questions. Exactly. Yeah, I, I agree. Shane, Shane is a victim as much as anybody else. And he did not end up in the crypt with the other people. So that's maybe true. he's, so he's probably fine. Yeah. Or maybe there's like tales from the kennel where he's got his own, <laughs> his own thing going on. Now I want to see that <laughs> of your many, of your many, uh, other world, uh, movies that you've you've come up with. I really want to see Tales from the Kennel. It's the flip side of that Burt Reynolds cartoon from 89, uh, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Cujo's there. No. Um, all right. So, yeah. Any, I, and that brings us to the wraparound section, which you kind of covered um, earlier where everyone like goes to hell after being in this waiting room. Um, any kind of overall thoughts uh, now that we've talked through all of the stories? Well, what I like about this, and I think what people liked about the show, is that we do get several stories. You know, it's like if you if you don't love, you know, the uh, the one with Ian Hendry as the cheating husband, just wait for ten more minutes, and you've got another one coming up, and you've got another one coming up. I feel like here all the stories are pretty solid. Uh, yeah. There's not the you know ebb and flow that you'll often find with anthologies where, okay, this one's good, that one's middling and then this one's really solid like there's one showcase uh standout but this this one feels like all of them kind of land they stick the landing right and you mentioned it before they all have a beginning middle and an end it's like reading a great short story or a, a tales from the crypt segment from a comic book there's it doesn't feel like oh the only reason we're telling this is for this one big set piece or this twist we get those and sometimes the big set piece is just a quick shot of a reflection in a coffee table or a guy's embalmed guts, but it's, it's really enough. Mm -hmm. And it left me kind of like the movie I talked to you about before we started recording, talk to me, which is coming out this weekend. Um, a really fun horror movie. One that left me wondering about kind of like the, the afterlife reality of what's going on in this movie. I'm still, I'm going to be thinking about Tales from the Crypt probably for the next several days. And that's not a comforting thought. <laughs> well, and I think, I mean, pursuing the other amicus uh, anthologies is also really fun, you know, fun path to travel down. You know, uh, I remember when I was doing uh, Horror 101, the book, uh, I was trying to figure out which one of these I wanted to include. And I ended up going with Asylum because I think Asylum has... For me, it's the best wraparound story and it's the best collection of stories together. Wow. Uh, so Asylum, and I think it came out maybe the same year or the year after, like it's right around the same time. They they started realizing, hey, these are quick, easy to make, and they make money. So like we had 71, 72, 72, 73, like they just started cranking these out. And the last one that they that came out was I think 76, and that's Tales of Witness Madness. And that's not a great note to end on. So it's also the least available. So you don't have to worry about stumbling on that one first. It's also a terrible title. What does it mean for a tale to witness madness? Good question. I, let alone multiple ones. Um, anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, AC, I, I've enjoyed uh, talking through these tales with you. Um, and, you know, I, I want to know where can people learn more about you and what you're up to? Tell us well, some tales about AC. Thank you. Well, and and as I've said before, I uh, I was inspired by uh, being on your show to start up my own uh, venture after years of the Horror 101 with Dr. AC blog. Uh, I now have the Horror 101 with Dr. AC YouTube channel, which uh, you can swing on by. We do a lot of anniversary shows. Uh, we just did one on uh, Twilight Zone, the movie, celebrating its... 40th anniversary. We've got uh, uh, Brian De Palma's sisters is going to be coming out this Friday, celebrating his 50th anniversary. So it's a lot of kind of callbacks to classic films that you may have not have seen, or you may not have seen in quite a while, or that you've seen recently and you love. So that's kind of what we're doing is kind of uh, introducing people to the history of horror, uh, much as we've done with these, uh, these Hammer series. 
Awesome. And, and you also mentioned, you know, you've also written, uh, edited some, some collections uh, about, you know, kind of horror criticism. Um, so I'll leave links to those down below. It's been a while since I've done that. So I've got to, got to keep, keep letting people know where they can see all of your stuff. It's also been a while since they came out. I think uh, hidden horror uh, is celebrating its 10th, 10th anniversary this year, speaking of anniversaries. So it's been a while. I probably should get back to the old book thing. 10 years, man, I, cause I, I remember know, when that, wow. <laughs> Time flies. Yes, it does. All right. Well, time's flying on this end too. So, uh, I guess we're going to, we're going to wrap up. We'll talk about something next month. I don't know if you happen to know offhand what we're talking about in August. I think it's legend of hell house. Ooh, I think uh, one that I'm well, if it's not, then we'll rearrange it because I want to talk about that one. I haven't seen it, but I love the title. Great. Um, <laughs> Let's just throw that in the slot for, for August then. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, AC. And, and until next time, uh, by, by the way, folks, um, check out all of his stuff. Links below. If you like this show, please feel free to like and subscribe and join us back here next month where you're talking about the legend of Hell House as we continue our journey beyond Hammerland. Until next time, whenever that is, whatever that is, thanks very much and take care.